so I think controlling stress is a big part of that, but um, physical health and eating habits and all those things are also uh, a contributor. So I think you have to, if you're not taking care of your body, you're adding more stress onto the other external stresses that are that are coming in, and you're going to you're going to pay for all that dearly somewhere down the road, unfortunately. But, um, so yeah, for me, physical activity, but you also I think important, um, and you, this kind of comes with that sense of experience and making mistakes and learning from them, is putting things in perspective. Um, and we always joke a little bit around around our office and the boardroom table with you know, is we're not brain surgeons, we're not going off to war, this is land planning and landscape architecture, you know, and so let's put things in perspective a little bit and, um, you know, and, and, and another part of this is a lot of discussion about life balance um, and, you know, it's a, I know it's, it's something you all talk about, think about, deal with. Um, you're here on a Saturday, um, you know, trying to advance your own uh, your own self, and, and that's really commendable, but you have to find that, that balance in life. And nowadays, you know, with, with, with this in your pocket all the time, you're on 24-7, and if you're working around the globe, you're literally on 24-7. Um, so you have to figure out when you put that aside. Um, you have to manage it. Um, and you have to, um, I just think, you know, put, put things in perspective at times and, and be able to shut things off. And, um, you know, I have two teenage daughters, so I keep, keep this. Talk about stress. With that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one's a lot more stressful than the other. But, um, so, yeah, I, it's, we kind of talk about not so much life-work balance, but how do you best integrate life It's an integration more than trying to say they're separate things and you got to balance some percentage of time to each. They really are integrated, and if you can figure out how to do that successfully without, um, you know, annoying your wife that you're up at been there every night still doing emails and things. But um, but you, it truly, in this day and age with technology, it it's it is about integration and figuring out the, how to do that. But it is important to have that personal time. It's, um, I think it's very true that if, if you spend your whole life um, just working, you're probably going to look back on that and regret it at some point. You know? So you, you do have to figure all these things out. But it, it comes with time and experience. Um, but I think it's also true, you don't get something for nothing. you got to pay your dues. you got to put in the time. You're, I don't remember what the, there's a saying about, you're, you can call yourself an expert when you put in so many thousands of hours of time doing something. But until then, you're, you're on a learning curve, and you have to put the time in. Um, so don't expect um, instant gratification on everything, because it's, it's, it, you have to work. I agree with the exercise, I think. Uh, I read this morning, too. I've been doing it for... 40 years, so it's 50 years, maybe longer. Um, exercise is a great way to get the endorphins going. I don't care what happens, you feel good afterwards. Um, and the balance, the lifestyle, all those things are important. The other thing is, is you can't remake history. Once something happens, it's done. You know, put it aside, learn from it. I mean, that's the important thing. You learn from it, but put it aside. You can't fit, you know, if it's done, it's over with, uh, you can't remake it. So you can whine all you want to about it. You can change it. So move on. And so that's just a mental exercise that you can do. When something bad happens, move on. And uh, there's other things that will be good things happening. Uh, but there won't be good things happening unless you move on. And uh, you can't live in the past, you've got to live in the future. And, uh, and I think you have to set personal goals for yourself. Um, we talked uh, uh, with Aaron and, uh, that you've got to have a passion for what you do. You can't wear your ego on your service leave. 
because no one's going to pay for ego. But you got to have an ego, and that ego is going to drive you to be the best that there is. Not second best, but the best. And you have to set those goals for yourself and strive for them. Um, I don't think you ever stop learning. Uh, the day you stop learning, you need to exit. You know, because life is passing you by, your business is passing you by, things that you're doing is passing you by. So you, you can always learn. And you can always learn from, from uh, being engaged and, uh, and from other people and their experiences. And uh, so we talked about relationships with people uh, in other professions and having those relationships over your entire lifespan. But I agree with you that it's not all work. You've got to have you got to have balance. But you're going to spend so much time at work. You better enjoy what you do. You better have a passion for it. You can't be good at it without a passion. It's, it just won't, it won't work. But uh, and how do you deal with stress? Uh, I mean, for me, nine times out of ten, the stress that I'm dealing with is either a problem or something I don't know. So when you get done with it, you know, like you said, you learn something from it, so at least you can take that away from it. Um, for me, the occasional cocktail definitely helps out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes where, but they, they hit the nail on the head. You've got to do something that's not work. Like you've got to get something that, at least for a little bit of your day, you're not thinking about work. It doesn't matter how much stuff you have going on, you just got to get away from it. Otherwise, you're going to drive yourself insane. And like they said, you're not, you're not going to want to do it anymore. So I think for me, that's the biggest thing, whether, like they said, running, exercising, whatever it may be, fishing, you know, hunting, whatever. you got to get away from work and not think about it for a couple hours and then come the next day. And it's going to make it that much easier for you the next time you, you try to jump on it and figure that whatever that issue was out. I'll add something that's related, but not exactly. Um, I'm very unusual because I have been with one company my whole career. And I graduated from school, I had an interview with DDSA, decided to take the job there um, in 1987. So June, I'll be 32 years there, um, and I don't, I'm not sure if I know of anybody in my age that has been in one one firm or one company. Um, and I, you know, I guess call it uh, intelligence or ignorance, I don't know which, but um, I think I recognized the culturally the EDSA was a great place to be, the, the work is very engaging, they treated me very well. And um, you know, I've had plenty of opportunities to, to jump and go go to some other firm. But I only say this because um, we talk a lot about this. We you know we hire people, we invest in people. And it's always hard when somebody decides to leave after five, six years or more because you've made an investment, you have a relationship there. And and I'm not saying you all should find one spot and stay there. Um, it it makes sense to move positions in your career at times. But it's also true that I heard this in a speech one time, it always has stuck with me. The grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence, it's greener where you fertilize it. So you put the effort in to, to where you are, if the circumstances are right, you know, it, it'll pay back to you and it'll come back to you. So um, I like to, I say that in part to our employees to hopefully get them to think about staying and not necessarily jumping all the time. But, um, and we, we have a certain amount of attrition as part of what happens in the business world, but um, but we do work hard to keep people as well. And so um, I just, uh, I'm probably very unusual for somebody my age and just been with one company that long. Well, that was only with one company. That's right. Well, actually not. He started with. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. He started with uh, stress on. The stress on. I don't know if you were. I know Fred very well. Yeah. He did the landscape architecture on my house. Uh -huh. So, anyway. Yeah, Ed came as a young man to South Florida, started working for another landscape architect in the late 50s, just for a couple of years. But I think his vision always was to have a lot. I got to tell you the impact that Ed made on other people uh, at the University of Florida, which some of us think is greatest university in the world. Um, uh, set up with the architecture department an endowment 
under Ed's name, and there's a uh, program every year that's put on, and all, all the EDSA put some money into it, but I would say 95% of the funds came from all of the people that knew Ed. And, uh, you know, that's a legacy that you can't buy. Um, that's a legacy that if you asked Ed to, for help on something, he would drop what he's doing and help you. And uh, he was that kind of person. He was that kind of person that Trammell Crow always said, that, you know, that uh, he's the kind of guy that other people want to help. I mean, um, we had <coughs> some wonderful experiences. Uh, Port Bougainville, we traveled around in a boat with uh, the guy that developed it, uh, Fritz Scherenberg. We didn't know what that was. Port Bougainville. The one in uh, his, uh, Oh. Uh, Port Port Gramont, it was the uh, developer and, uh, in his boat and, and looked at the architecture. They tried to duplicate it and do it. You, you guys did the yeah. land plan on it. Um, I mean, those kind of experiences are just, uh, life is experiences. You've got to have some experiences in, in life and let's get back to the balance again. Um, so when you add up the things at the end of the day, it's not how many, I mean, <coughs> People are fond of saying you can't hook a U-Haul into the hearse. So, you know, it's not about how much money you made, but what what indelible impact that you made and, and how you lived your life and uh, how you might have uh, impacted others around you. Those are the things that I think are very important. See, real estate is like philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and real estate developers, you know, look philosophy at always the Philosophy will be Yeah. Huh? Um, philosophy with an IRR. Yeah. <laughs> um, questions, folks. I know it's late. You're like looking at the time. I want to have the opportunity for everyone here to ask additional questions. This is the very few times you have these kind of experts in that same room. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I used to work for many years for a company called Dave. Um, and they Accenture, I don't know if you know that company. Accenture. Business Consulting, Accenture. Well, it's a very so it's big, big company. It's part of it, Arthur Anderson. Yeah, it used to yeah. be. And uh, I am surprised how similar this is to consulting, you know, in the corporate, I'd say, consumers, you know, government. Uh, so it's, it's really similar. And uh, also the way you do the presentation, the way you slide, I mean, it's really, really similar. The way you know what you explain about payments and going after the clients and everything is like really, really similar. So I'm very happy because it makes me feel like yeah, I could I, apply. You learned something. Yeah, I could apply what I know. Yeah. You know, in, yeah. in real estate eventually. And um, uh, well, I worked in real estate recently, maybe five, six years ago. Smaller companies, and uh, well, this is my experience there. But I did have a question: uh, is do you get some financing for the services you provide, or it's the company's financing? Because normally you charge for your services, like you don't have to invest, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I think this goes back to an earlier question. We, we certainly, because of dealing with real estate projects, we've had opportunities over the years to say, well, how about you take a piece of the project, you take an equity piece, of, of payment of fees, and I think, uh, again, in the early years, Ed and some of the original partners took took a few of those offers. Um, but we Chubb, okay. Chubb, yeah, that was one. But, um, there's some land on Norman's Key, I think, if you go to Costa Rica. But um, uh, no, but basically the structure is is that we we provide a proposal with the scope of services and a related fee, and, and that's a transaction. Um, and then you do the work and you have to collect the fee. <laughs> and that, that's not always easy um, in the consulting world. But, but I think you're right, the, the basic business structure of service providing consulting is, that there's a commonality to that. Um, even though the service that you're providing may how, how about you, John? Because you're doing executive search. 
are you like almost like in a like a, with lawyers like in a retainer concept or are you doing like literally a consulting flat fee for that successful search no we uh, we only work on retainer um, and we set the retainer uh, which is consistent with the uh, business norms in, in that business which is a multi-billion dollar business worldwide but uh, had about a third of the first year income and we started incomes generally about you know, it all depends on the economic cycle but let's say two hundred thousand and above and uh, we set a retainer based on a third of that plus our out of pocket expenses and we're paid the third up front and a third after thirty and sixty days respectively. <clears throat> Occasionally we'll put something on the end. We talked about China. I, we did a project in Shenzhen for uh, for three Chinese entrepreneurs that were, uh, I was brought in by the TPC, the Tournament Players Association, because they were going to do World Cup of Golf there. Jack Nicholas had built three courses and they wanted to, it was called Mission Hills, and uh, they wanted somebody to run that thing that knew how to manage that, a championship golf course, because there wasn't anybody in China at the time. Um, and so, and we needed somebody that worked in Asia, so we found somebody that had done work in Japan. And unfortunately, uh, in a lot of places in the world, they didn't have championship golf. Um, and uh, and so we brought him over to the board. He was accepted, and uh, he went back. Actually, he was in Honolulu at the time, and he went back. And two weeks later, I got a call, and he said, "You know, I didn't have my offer letter," and I said. Uh, well, let me call and find out. You've obviously made the offer and accepted. So I called my one of the three. These were three billionaires, um, and I called one of my guys, the, the, one of the three, and uh, who hired me. And he said, "Yeah, I was just bought out by the, it was a Thai Chinese uh, partner, and he says he's going to do it himself. And so we don't need a guy. You know, he doesn't." And, uh, and I got a note from them, a very nice note, how wonderful it was to work with me, and how, what a great job I did, and so forth and so on, but they forgot to put my last retainer in their budget, so that if I'd accept 10%, then uh, well, they'd get a check out immediately, or wired immediately. And uh, at the time, the turnover hadn't happened. You know, we were still under British law in Hong Kong. So I wrote them a letter back saying how wonderful it was to work with them, and, how great they are to work with and so forth and so on. But if I don't have cleared funds, then I get 96 hours, then uh, Baker McKinsey is going to take over and we'll take it to court. And, but in a very nice way. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and 95 hours and 39 minutes, I had cleared funds in my account. So uh, that was a, a good story. But the Chinese were infamous about doing that. And so were the Arabs. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a constant battle. It's a constant battle. Yeah, as a, as a, again, a design consultant, one of the things we have learned over the years is you have to get a, an initial payment, uh, an upfront payment, which we usually set as some percentage of the overall fee. Um, and then you, you, know, you can apply that on the final invoices. Um, but it gives you a little bit of an insurance policy to get the process started. And it, it tells you whether or not they're going to be a serious, you know, client and, and pay on time and so forth. But it's it, it never makes some clients are good, not all clients are, are challenging. But um, it, it's a constant battle. It's probably one of the biggest challenges of the business side of the, uh, the design world. You had a question. This is more of a, a personal nature, but where are you from? Miami. Okay. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> this is the time where you usually come up with a follow-up question based on that. You can't talk about that one too much. My history was in history, Renaissance and Reformation economic history, which I love. But I hated to teach. I didn't want to teach. So, But I wanted to do, uh, my mother was British, and I had some traveling before, and I wanted to do work internationally, but nobody would hire me internationally because, well, I was a history maker, and uh, and so as it turns out, we do a lot of international work, but I had to do it myself. And, 
Uh, I'm from Miami, and, and uh, South Florida is, look, Fort Lauderdale. I, I live on almost an acre on deep water. I can take a boat, I could have usually, I could have taken a boat to work. I actually did two or three times. It's like a pool. They're nice to have, you probably never use it, but you can, because it's there. And, and uh, we got an airport five minutes, six minutes away, and uh, you got the downtown that's two minutes, three minutes away. You got every, there's no other city in the world that's, that gives you what Florida, what, South, what Fort Lauderdale does, even Miami, where I'm from. Miami got too crowded, I wanted to come to a small town. <laughs> <laughs> and Fort Lauderdale's a small town. I mean, it's, uh, it's a pretty small town. The, the reason I ask is um, your accent's um, not one I've heard down here. <laughs> That's the guy from Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It sounds, it's colloquially, like colloquially, it sounds similar to someone's back home. Well, we used to do a lot of work in, I didn't start out in real estate, I started out in high technology. And I knew as much about, you know, I got hired once to do a search for, somebody head up engineering for a semiconductor uh, business for digital equipment, which is a big uh, computer manufacturing company at the time. And I had no idea what a semiconductor was. And they hadn't invented the internet yet, so I had to take out Encyclopedia Britannica and read it on the plane. And I was meeting with the head engineer. And, uh, but by the time I got done doing the assignment and looking for somebody, and they all had PhDs, and they were in Silicon Valley and Tech in uh, Dallas and uh, so forth, uh, people were asking me where I got my PhD. And so, you know, you just kind of glomp on to whatever you're doing. And, and when I was doing work in Minnesota, we used to do work for Medtronic, a flammable face maker company, did all the work. And they all spoke with a Minnesota accent, you know, and I found myself with a Minnesota accent. <laughs> yeah, so you're weak. we didn't have an accent in South Florida. I mean, what were we? We weren't deep south. We were some midway somewhere. And uh, I'm not sure what we were. Um, so I'm not sure what the accent was. <coughs> When you were talking about the, the PepsiCo the headquarters, and you, were, and you mentioned that the way productivity went up and I guess call outs went down, was that like a happy coincidence kind of thing, or was that something that was kind of planned into it? You know, I'm not, I don't know if I know the answer to that. I, I know it was a, an outcome for other projects. Whether they thought that was going to happen, and the genesis of moving from New York City up to that location. I, I don't know that whole story, quite honestly. But um, again, I think it's you know this is something that is now part of the design process. Is, is how do you improve those kinds of uh, metrics and outcomes? Um, back in the late '60s, somebody had I'm going to guess somebody involved in that had a vision for why they wanted to move to that location. Right. That's what I would. And it had to be part of, look, this would be a better, a nicer place for people to kind of work every day and that kind of thing. And whether they thought of it in the same terms we do today, I don't know. But, right. but it, it is an interesting, I think, case study of probably unintentional outcomes at the time that, uh, you know, definitely happened. But those are things you can learn from, too. I mean, you can see how it works and say, well, you know, a good developer. Uh, Bill Bone from uh, the Sunrise Company, uh, very successful, developed most of uh, the Palm Desert. Uh, wherever he went, he always used to take a notepad and, and he'd, he'd go through and he'd look at all kinds of projects, he'd take little notes and I'd ask him what he's doing. He said, I'm doing research and copy. So I'm going to other projects around the country and I'm seeing what works for them. And then I'm bringing it back to see if it would work for us. And uh, you can learn from others. You don't have to invent everything. You can you can learn from others. You can learn from experiences. You can learn from what's working. And uh, it's important to know what's going on around you. It's important to know what others are doing because it's a competitive world. And uh, so if you're designing or building a product, it, it's got to be competitive. And so um, little ideas in the in the wreck industry that didn't used to be there. They used to be you build for the guy. He built a great golf course and he built some, you know, some homes around the golf course. And, and, and the reason homes are built on the golf course, by the way, 
was Charles Frazier. Um, Charles Frazier developed off Hilton Head. He ran out of land, oceanfront land. So what do I do now? So he built golf courses, and he said, I wonder if people will buy homes on a golf course. Never used to do that. They did it the European way. They built the golf course here. They built the homes over here. But he put homes on a golf course, and they saw my hotcakes. They almost got um, the same value you got by being on the marsh of the ocean. And uh, not quite, but right up there. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I mean, everybody copied it. And, and now it's a, sort of a standard. You know, people build homes on a golf course. And you that all came from one guy. You also know why. So when I went through my urban planning phase in my life, you know, ended up with some decrease on that, is we looked at golf courses that have like around the clubhouse, apartment buildings, condos, or even single family homes as the prototype for a green gated community. Yep. Because it will take a while for someone to walk over the ninth uh, green to back to your back porch to break in. You don't really, uh, even if you don't even need any gates or something because you have natural features that really abandon that guy who will steal your television. But people uh, also like to look out their window and see a sea of green rather than yeah, uh, yes. another yeah. building. And, uh, and grass is very calming to look at, you know. Um, and um, other little things that they did in Seapine, what a great creator. They hired half the class of Harvard at one time and brought them in to learn the business back in the 70s. It ended up going bankrupt, but it was because of an economic cycle. But uh, they, they had a little one acre site that everybody got a small piece and they could come garden and grow vegetables on. It became a huge amenity. It didn't cost anything, but it was a huge amenity for the project. Now you see food being grown on resorts all over as an amenity. And people that go to the resorts, you know, they, they go to look at where the vegetables and other things are being grown there that they serve in the restaurants. And so food has become an amenity for not just what's served in the uh, you know, in the restaurants, but but it's 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 going from the, their own little farm to their restaurant, and uh, it's unique. And now everybody's doing it. And uh, you know, there's other. You know, I'm sure you're far yeah, I think they, Just back to the golf thing, um, real quick. There's not a lot of golf courses being built no. these days, and not golf-based golf course communities. But you know, to your point, uh, people love live on the golf course, not because they play golf, because in fact, statistics are they only about 25% of 30%, yeah. 30 that live on the course actually play golf. Right. But it's a, it's a big green park, yeah. basically. And, and so the transition now, in a lot of these communities where the, the, it's been harder to support the golf because less people are playing and et cetera, is, is what do you do with that open space? And in some places, it's actually being converted into just parkland. Rather than, than function golf, um, so it's a new dynamic in community planning too. Is what replaces what the golf course was to community plan back in the '70s and '80s. It's now open space, trails, and walking because that's the number one activity that people engage in. Well, you know, in, in the beginning, I said they sold to the man, and if he loved to play golf, it was a great golf course that he'd come by. But they soon realized that the guy also had a wife. And so maybe they ought to pay attention to her. So they started paying attention to her, and then they realized that they actually have kids. And, um, and so they learned, and it, these were painful lessons over the years. But the hierarchy of that was if the kids didn't have fun and they didn't want to go, guess what? And the wife said, I'm not going, so you can play golf. And, uh, and so he couldn't stroke a jack. And so now they plan for not only do they plan for the kids, they plan for the grandkids, um, you know, and the compounding, so that some of the most important features of, of communities are being developed are for the kids. Because the kids can't wait to get back. That makes it really easy to buy. Um, again, something you don't need, but, um, you know, some, when you're buying that lifestyle, right, don't you find you're doing that all the time? Absolutely. I mean, and then there are, you know, age targeted communities where the Amenities and facilities, but open space used to be more so golf. Now it's uh, open space in other expressions is uh, is still really a driver of value in real estate. 
there, do you want to say something? Just a quick question. So, I mean, you've established an incredible network and people obviously come to you now. So when you're first starting out, how would you recommend establishing those client bases and you know, really enhancing those relationships and making sure, obviously, through good service and whatnot, like how do you find, like what's the most successful aspects of that? I'm not, a, I'm not a good example. When I started the business, it didn't exist in the state of Florida, and for good reason, there was no business in the state. And again, I wasn't in real estate, I was, a, right. I was a general practice. So I uh, I went, uh, somebody had told me about the uh, business. I had done some just general recruiting, and the, uh, what do you do with a history degree? Um, and so uh, I had opened up my own firm, but I just I wasn't having fun. And, uh, and so, Somebody went and introduced me to the executive search business. Again, it didn't exist in the state of Florida. And so I went and visited some firms in Chicago and New York, and, and, uh, and boy, I got my batteries charged. This is what I want to do. This is it. There were two things wrong with it. Number one, it didn't exist in Florida. And the second thing, I was way too young. I was 26. Um, and I didn't know why I could not be successful. I didn't know why I should fail. Um, but I should have. Um, so I took standard and pores, again, the internet had not yet been invented, and I just picked at random some companies that I thought I'd like to do business for, and one of them was Medtronic, digital equipment, and we ended up going out and I sold myself into those companies and saying, look, I know you got relationships, but give me a try. If I can't beat them, you won't hire me again. And uh, so, and then, Toss a bone to me, and uh, and I had to perform, and we ended up doing all the Medtronic's work. There was a little tiny, 100, 200 million dollar company now, but five billion, but six billion dollars. Digital equipment the same way. They're a hundred million dollar company, doubling in size every year, um, and uh, we did work for Xerox. We were the largest vendor, executive search for Xerox. See, in Florida, when you were in the services business, like lawyers or executive search. If it was in Florida, it couldn't be any good. They all went to New York, or they went to Atlanta, or they went to Chicago to buy those services. And that's where the good services are. But outside the state of Florida, they didn't know that. So that secret was kept in Florida. So they thought it was kind of cool working with somebody in Fort Lauderdale, you know, as long as I delivered. And, uh, and again, it's all about delivery, right? If you deliver the services, if you can meet or exceed what your expectations to your clients are, then you don't have to worry about business. You know, it just comes. And, uh, and, you know, I'm not sure I even know how to market uh, the service. You know, I joined the Urban Land Institute. That's one good thing. But uh, I joined the ULI in 1980. I haven't missed a meet, national meeting since. Um, for the first eight or nine years, I don't think anybody knew what I did for a living. I wanted to learn the business. Um, and I joined the council. and. And people on my council would ask me, what do you actually do? <laughs> and I explained to them, and they say, well, wow, you know, we've got a need, or, you know, and so that's kind of how it happened. Um, you know, uh, I always say marketing, you don't need an MBA for marketing. You know, it's like the corner gas station. You take it in, get your oil changed, the guy says, you know, I, I saw something wrong, I fixed it. You know, the, the part is a dollar, but I didn't want you driving around with you know, a bad thing, I just fix it, there's no charge, you know, go on your way. Would you ever not take your car back? You know, and would you not want to bring all your friends, you know, to the place you just found? I know gas stations don't do that anymore, that's the law school, but, you know, it's a similar business. If you can meet or exceed your expectations, then you're always going to be hot, then you're always going to be asked back, because not everybody does that. And it's the same in your business. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, I would say that it's a it's a progression for most people through their career. It's because of obviously it takes time to build a network, um, and you do have to work at it. Um, you can't be a wallflower. Um, you don't have to be an extrovert to be a good business development person. Uh, but um, it's all about these connections and, and the network that you that you create. You also, to John's point, you have to deliver um, a, a, a service that people think you know is valuable, and that's a big part of it. If you can do that, people will come back and repeat business. Um, and we all hope to do as much repeat business.
business as possible because you don't have to put as much effort into into, into that. But um, you know, there's in the real estate world, there's all kinds of venues, you know, conferences and, and um, networking events and different things. And ULI has, has been a great conduit, I think, for our firm as well to be on the real estate world. But so there's there's a whole menu of things that you can be doing. You sort of have to pick and choose and prioritize what you think is going to have the best payback for you personally, but you, it's like the other thing I said, you've got to, you do have to put the time in. And a big part of it is delivering whatever your core business is, you've got to deliver quality, and that, that's your best marketing. And, and like Doug said, when you do join an organization, don't be a wallflower. I mean, join an organization even though they're not paying you to do it, but do something. You know, get active. The more active you are, the more you're going to get noticed. More people are uh, uh, the more relationships you're going to make. Um, so be very active in that association, whether it be the ULI or the myriad of other organizations that there are. I just happen to like ULI the best. Um, and, uh, and the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. And um, and you know, business will follow. Okay, <clears throat> and I'm going to use that advice as closure for today's class. I want to, I want to thank you guys for coming in today, um, Kyle, John, and Doug. Um, this was very, very insightful. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to your families and friends for thank all the you. time we have been taken away from you. Oh, them. And for the students, thank you for staying awake. It's a long day. The recommendation for the next meetup we have in two weeks is keep taking notes. Why? Because it keeps your brain with the listening and writing down active. Yeah? Um, I posted the questions and the memos assignment, so we are up to date. Go home, relax, have some quality time, and then think about school tomorrow. All right? Good night. Let me just say, if anybody wants to think of another question and you want to get back to me, you can do it through Thomas. He's got my today. Yeah. 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 Yeah.